Welcome to the video for chapter 11 of the Cambridge Introduction to Sanskrit, which is going to formally introduce you to external Sandhi and is going to focus on consonant Sandhi. Let's begin by recapping what we already know about Sandhi. Sandhi or Sandhi is a term that literally means putting together, and it's a Sanskrit technical term for changes in pronunciation that occur when sounds come in contact with other sounds, whether within words, which is what we then call internal sandhi, or at word boundaries, i.e. the last sound of one word and the next, first sound of the following word, which is what we would consider external sandhi. Sandhi happens across languages. For example, in English, if you compare do you versus don't you, you can tell that there is a little bit of a difference in the pronunciation of the you the second time. First time I say you, second time I say something closer to chu, do you versus don't chu. This happens because this y is preceded by a voiceless sound t in the second example, and so itself it also becomes a little less voiced, it becomes more voiceless. Do you versus don't you. The difference in Sandhi between English and Sanskrit is that Sanskrit regularly reflects these pronunciation changes in writing. It's basically as though English would write do you versus don't you, D-O-N-T-C-H-O-U. Now, given that Sanskrit does reflect these pronunciation changes in writing, we A can tell pretty accurately how Sanskrit would have been pronounced, but B, it also means that we need to know about all these pronunciation changes so that when we see them reflected in writing, we can still identify the individual words that have been changed through Sandhi. So in other words, we see don't you, D-O-N-T-C-H-O-U, and still need to be able to um, to determine, to find out, to remember that underlyingly this is don't you. External Sandhi can be summed up as the following. Sanskrit words regularly change their pronunciation when they stand together with other words. Sanskrit spelling marks all these changes. This process is called external Sandhi and its general principles are quite simple. One, the last sound of a word changes depending on the first sound of the next word. Sometimes that first sound also changes. Two, a consonant at the end of a word becomes more similar to the first sound of the next word. And three, a vowel at the end of a word interacts and usually merges with a following vowel. A vowel at the end of a word remains the same when a consonant follows. Let's focus on the consonant part of this. A consonant at the end of a word becomes more similar to the first sound of the next word. Now, becoming more similar means adopting one or several of the features of that sound at the beginning of the next word, and such features include voice, aspiration, nasalization, and so on. So, for example, a voiceless sound becomes voiced before another voiced sound. So, T changes into D, K becomes G, or more uh, strictly put, K becomes G, and so on. For example, in Nagarat, Gramam, Kachati, he is going from the city, Nagarat, to the village, Gramam. We have a change in Nagarat to Nagarad. The T changes into its voiced equivalent D because it's followed by a voiced sound at the beginning of Gramam. And so instead of Nagarat, we have Nagarad, Gramam, Kachati. Before a word initial nasal, preceding final stops turn into the equivalent nasal. So, for example, gramam nagarat nagacchati. He is not going nagacchati, nagarat, from the city, gramam, to the village. Nagarat, he stands in front of na. Na begins with a nasal, and therefore the t at the end of nagarat also turns into a nasal. T is a dental stop, and therefore it turns into the dental nasal, n, and we are left with gramam Nagaran na gachati. Aspiration of initial consonants, however, does not affect the preceding sound. So if I have a word that begins with k, g, ch, j, and so on, this aspiration is not passed on to the sound at the end of the preceding word. However, initial h, voices preceding stops, 
and this H itself turns into the corresponding voiced aspirated stop. For example, Nagarat, he gachati, he is indeed, he means indeed, going away from the city, Nagarat. We have Nagarat followed by an H at the beginning of he. The T at the end of Nagarat becomes voiced, so Nagarat is changed into Nagarad, and he is changed into the corresponding voiced aspirated stop, corresponding to the sound at the end of the preceding word. The, that sound is a dental, and so the H turns into the dental voiced aspirated stop, D. If we had a word that ended in a vila, um, the H would have voiced that vila, so for example from K to G, and itself would have changed into the vila voiced aspirated stop, G and so on. Sandhi is actually made much easier by the fact that there's only a small number of so-called permitted final sounds um, in word final position, i.e. at the end of a word in Sanskrit, you will find only a handful of consonants, you will not find any voiced stops, and you will not find any aspirated stops, and palatals are entirely absent. And so this limits the number of possible external sandhi combinations that involve stops, and therefore we can put um, all the different possibilities for external sandhi into one table which is this table here, and yes, it looks a little scary. So let's look at this bit by bit. In the top line, where it says final sound, we have those just mentioned permitted final sounds. So there is a K, so K, there's T, there's T, there's P, there's N, N, and M. On the right-hand side, we have the initial sounds of the following word, so the sounds that the following word, the next word, begins with. In the first line, we have zero, meaning there is no word following. The word that we're looking at is the final word in a sentence. And if that's the case, then actually all these sounds remain exactly as they are. So final K remains as K, final T remains, remains as T, final T remains as T, and so on. Initial words, sorry, initial sounds of following words might be any sound, so they could be vowels, they could be any of our velas, so k o k, g o g, palatals, ch o ch, j o j, retroflex sounds, dental sounds, labial sounds, nasals, words can start with n or with m, they could be semivowels, so y o w, or r or l, they can be any of our s sounds, so sh, sh or s or they could be an H. These are the possibilities for what a word may begin with. As I'm sure you've noticed, the lines of this table come in two colors. Now, the ones that are colored in are basically for all those lines where the initial sound of the following word is voiced. So this could be vowels, this could be g or g, j or j, D or D, D or D, B or B, N, M, Y, W, R, L, and H. In Sanskrit, H or H is voiced. And whenever you have one of these sounds, then what happens is that the preceding sound, the final sound at the end of the preceding word, is voiced. Furthermore, what happens is that if the next word, the following word, begins with a nasal, then the final sound of the preceding word is nasalized. So if you look at the line for N or M, which is about a little bit more than halfway down this table, you will see that K has changed into N. N is the velar nasal corresponding to the velar stop K. T has changed into N. So the retroflex stop has changed into the retroflex nasal. T has changed into N. The dental has changed into the dental nasal. P, the labial stop, has changed into the labial nasal M. N is a nasal, remains as a N. Final N is a nasal, remains as N. And final M, 
finally changes into anuswara because and that's a change change that we've already looked at if you have a final m it remains as an m in front of a vowel or it changes into an anuswara in front of anything else now how can we make sense how can we approach how can we memorize this admittedly huge table there actually are quite a number of ways to familiarize yourself with the sunday rules First of all, you might find it helpful to photocopy or print out the Sunday tables um, from this book or from the book website, cambridge-sanskrit.org. You can find handouts to print out in the other resources section. Once you've done that, use this printout or use this photocopy as a bookmark and refer to it very regularly. Basically, whenever you can't recognize um, a Sunday that you're looking at, just Look at the table, find out what it is, and the more often you do that, the more familiar you will become with all these little details. However, what's perhaps even more important than understanding, sorry, than knowing all the little details is understanding the basic principles behind consonant Sunday. So to remember that a final consonant changes and becomes more similar to the consonant at the beginning of the next word or the sound at the beginning of the next word. And if the sound at the beginning of the next word is voiced, it itself becomes voiced. If it's a nasal, it itself becomes nasalized and so on. If you do want to memorize anything, then it should be the columns for final T, final N and final M, because those are by far the most frequently occurring consonants at the end of Sanskrit words. And out of these three columns, M actually is really easy, because if M at the end of a word is followed by nothing or followed by a vowel, it remains as M. If it's followed by anything else, the M changes into an anuswara A. If you know that, You've already memorized your first column in the constant Sunday table. There's one more thing that we need to look at concerning Sunday, and that is um, Sanskrit writing conventions. Now, as was already mentioned, Sanskrit does reflect pronunciation changes that come about through Sunday in its writing. So, for example, if a final sound becomes voiced, so, for example, a T changes into a D, then that is reflected in the writing. But there's one other thing that we need to know about, and that concerns words that end in a consonant. Normally, if a word ends in a consonant and no vowel follows, then this is rendered by writing that word with a virama at the end. A virama is that little diagonal dash at the bottom of a consonant that indicates this consonant is not followed by any other vowel. Now, a virama is actually only used at the end of a word where no other word follows. If a word ends in a consonant, and therefore a virama, and another word follows, then actually what happens is that use of virama is avoided by combining the two words in writing. So, for example, we have the sentence from earlier, nagarat hi gachati, which changes through Sandhi into nagarad dhi gachati. So, in front of an H, the T becomes voiced, and the H changes into the corresponding voiced aspirated stop, so into dh, and so we have nagarad dhi gachati. As I said, Sanskrit avoids using a virama within a sentence, and so the d and the d are, are, are combined in writing, and that's how we arrive at nagaradhi gachati. He is indeed going away from the city. If we have, to look at another example, nagarad na gachati, he is not going away from the city, then the t in front of the n, nagarat in front of na, changes into an n, so we have nagaran na in front of a nasal a stop also changes into a nasal and it changes into the corresponding nasal so the dental stop t changes into the dental nasal n nagaran na gacchati and again we don't want to use virama inside a sentence and so from nagaran na gacchati we get the spelling nagaran na gacchati finally nagarat iha gacchati he is going here Nagarat from the city. Nagarat is followed by a word beginning with a vowel. 
a vowel is always voiced and so nagarat in front of a voiced sound changes into nagarad and this nagarad is then joined in writing with iha and that means rather than having the i at the beginning of iha that is used at the beginning of a word so rather than having this full sign for i we now use the sign for i that we get whenever an i a short i follows upon a consonant and so we have nagaradiha gachati this makes reading sanskrit considerably more difficult because rather than having individual words you now have things that could be one very long word or indeed they could be more than one word what it takes to cope with that is basically patience and experience and the knowledge that generations of sanskrit students before you have found it challenging but have in the end mastered it the whole thing becomes even more tricky when we look at words beginning with an initial a with a with a short a because if you remember a short a after a consonant is not written is not indicated at all so for example nagarat apagachati he goes away from the city gives us nagarad apagachati and then finally the two words are joined in writing so that we can avoid the use of the virama at the end of nagarad and so you have nagarad apagachati if you're faced in a text with nagarad apagachati you will probably be able to recognize nagarad as nagarat but then it will be very very easy to just read the next word as pagachati and if you can't recognize that then i can't blame you because pagachati is not a word what you need to remember is that actually there is an a an unwritten a in there and so you need to then split this up as nagarad apagachati a joyful note here there is no joining up of words um, after an anuswara or visaga so for example if i have narang pashyami i see a man then after this anuswara the words are not joined up similarly with narach pashyati at the end uh, or after this visaga narach there is no joining of words the words remain written separately and therefore are much easier to recognize that was it for this chapter we hope that you found this video helpful and if you have any comments or suggestions we would love to hear from you please do write to us at ruppel at cambridge-sanskrit.org and now for your own work on this material good luck and have fun